Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, it was the disciples who said, Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And we say the same thing today as your people. Where are we going to go? We can go to Fox News. We can go to CNN. We're going to go to uh, any kind of PhD or medical doctor. Where are we going to go? A politician? An emperor? A ruler? A king? Where are we going to go? We are going to go to Jesus Christ and the words of Christ. And we know, Father, that that all of, Bi all of the Bible, including Exodus, is breathed out by the Spirit of God and is the very Word of God. So, Father, I pray that as we come to your Word, that we would receive it as the Word of life that it is. Your law, it is it's a map. It shows us what we are called to do. It is a muzzle. It restrains from sin. And it's also a mirror. It shows us our, our great need of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that as we look at this commandment, that your spirit would be with us today, and that Christ be honored and exalted. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've taken a break from our series on the Ten Commandments for some time here. Uh, we took a break for Christmas, and then for New Year's, uh, New Year's sermon, and then also last week with the, uh, the baptism message that we had, and those that were baptized. Well, today we are resuming our series on the Ten Commandments. And today we are coming to the Sixth Commandment, and I know you children have been uh, going through the Ten Commandments at home and with Miss Abby, so here's the question I have for you today. What is the Sixth Commandment? You shall not murder. Very good. Let's say it together. Ready? You shall not murder. Very good. That is the Sixth Commandment. You shall not murder. It's only four short words. And in Hebrew, it's actually even shorter. It's only two word. It's lo ratzak. Literally, it's no murder. That's all it is. No murder. But even though it's so short, we're actually going to spend all of this week and all of next week on these four short words. We're going to spend two weeks on this commandment. And I want to give you a few reasons why we're going to spend two weeks on four short words. One is, this commandment speaks to so much. Uh, I mentioned before, but Psalm 119 says that God's commandment is exceedingly broad. The, when you're looking at the full application of God's law, it covers so much. And especially when you look at our land today, in the many ways in which we violate this commandment, but then especially next week as we're looking at how this commandment, it speaks to our heart. It speaks to our desires. Uh, it speaks to our passions. And there's such a broad application there that there's no way that I could cover it all in just one week. So we're going to take two weeks for that reason. Another one is there's a lot of ignorance today when it comes to justice on life issues. Our culture speaks of justice when it comes to life issues. We speak of criminal justice reform. We speak of reproductive justice. We speak of uh, families of of murdered loved ones, that they cry out for justice. They want justice from the judge or from the jury. But as a whole, our culture doesn't know what it's talking about. Proverbs 28.5 says this, Evil men do not understand justice. But those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Evil men, wicked men do not understand justice. 
They'll talk about justice, they'll insist about, upon justice, but they don't understand it. And one of the core reasons for this is because they believe that the standard is themselves. Man is the measure of all things. We're the measure of all things. It's our desires, our preferences. That's the standard of justice. And that, that's a faulty standard. Because justice doesn't begin with us. It begins with God, with his character, and then revealed in his law. And that's why that proverb says, it's those who seek the Lord who understand justice completely. So in this land where there's a lot of ignorance when it comes to justice on life issues, we need to seek the Lord and we need to look at his law so that we might understand what does justice actually look like. Then a third reason is we live in a land of violence. It's a third reason why we're spending two weeks on this is because we live in a land that is awash in violence. Uh, you, you've seen over the last few years that murder rates have skyrocketed. But it's not just that. Uh, it, it, it permeates every aspect of us. Uh, violence is entertainment for us today. And it's not just for adults, it's for young children. I saw a study this last week that said that by the time an average child finishes elementary school, so what's that, is that sixth grade? By the time an average child finishes sixth grade, he will have watched 8,000 televised murders. 8,000 televised murders. It's just entertainment for us as adults and for kids. For many, life no longer has any value. One medical professor named Malcolm Potts says this, quote, We can no longer base our ethics on the idea that human beings are a special form of creation made in the image of God. And then he goes on to say that that kind of belief, it's just religious mumbo-jumbo. And he said that we should no longer, quote, regard as sacrosanct the life of each and every member of our species. We're not made in the image of God. That's just religious mumbo-jumbo. And the idea that every life is sacred, every life is valuable, that is not true. This mindset is not just limited to this medical professor. A lot of people have this mindset today. So we need to hear what God's standard is when it comes to the issue of life. And we need to hear what is the standard that our Savior fulfilled through his obedient life and his atoning death on the cross. And we need to hear what is the standard that the spirit of the living Christ dwelling within us enables us to walk in obedience to. So today we're going to look at three questions. We'll ask and answer three questions. And the first question is this. What kind of killing is not prohibited in the Sixth Commandment? So we'll look at what is prohibited in the Sixth Commandment. But there, are, there is killing that's not prohibited in this commandment. And I think it's important to start here because the King James Version is one of the few translations that translates the Sixth Commandment as, you shall not kill. And perhaps because of that translation, that there's those who believe that this is this is a blanket statement on any kind of killing. Uh, I've even heard this even applies to, to eating bacon, to having hot dogs, eating steaks. You shall not kill. We're in violation if you're, if you're eating that. But this is not what that word ratzak, what it means. It's not that broad. And this is also not what the rest of Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that the taking of human life is not only sometimes permissible, but in some cases, justice even requires it. So let me give three instances briefly. We won't spend a lot of time here, but three instances in which some forms of killing is not prohibited by the Sixth Commandment. Here's the first one. Self-defense. Self-defense is not prohibited in Scripture by the Sixth Commandment. Scripture teaches that when we or loved ones are under an immediate threat of a violent attack, that it is permissible to stop that threat by taking that person's life. Keep your finger here. Just go forward uh, maybe a page or two. Look at Exodus 22, 2 through 3. Go to Exodus 22, 2 through 3. Here's what God's Word says. If a thief is found breaking in, and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun is risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. 
Now, the, the point in this case law here is that if it is clear that an intruder is not a threat to your safety, verse 3, it talks about how the sun has risen, and this intruder here, he's a thief. So he's not coming to, to kill you. He's not coming to do any violence to you. He's coming to, to, kill your, to, to steal your things. But there's not a threat of violence towards you then we are not permitted to respond in self-defense, in, in killing that person. So God's law does talk about the penalty that is upon a thief. He's to make restitution, but a thief is not to be put to death. But in verse 2, it says, if there's an intruder that comes at night, a thief comes at night, and you don't know at night if he's coming to, to steal, he's coming through your window, he's going through your door, he breaks it open, and you don't know if he's coming to do harm to you and to your family or to just steal your possessions, then it's not unlawful that that person is put to death. There is no blood guilt, God's word says. And this isn't just something that's talked about in the Old Testament. Jesus, in the Gospels, he encourages his disciples to take up a sword in self-defense. We see this in Luke twenty-two thirty-six, which says this, And Jesus said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag ta take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. If you don't have a sword, Jesus is saying, difficult times are coming, sell what you have so that you can buy a sword. So it's not wrong to have a sword in our day, we could say, it's not wrong to have a gun to be used in self-defense. Now, of course, we should say, if there is a violent intruder, if there is violence being done to us, uh, we don't need to respond in self-defense. There are other options, and if we can pursue those other options, uh, those are often good options to pursue. So, for example, if we can flee and we don't have to respond in self-defense, that is a good option. Saul, King Saul, was pursuing David, trying to kill him, and David's response was not self-defense, but his response was to flee. So if we can flee from violence, that is a good response. Also, if we are suffering personally, for, especially for our allegiance for Christ, then it may glorify Christ most to forego your rights and simply to lay down your life for Christ, to be a martyr for the sake of the gospel. But if your life, or I would say especially the lives of loved ones, are being harmed, it is permissible to act in self-defense. And in fact, to defend others from violent harm is a form of love isn't it? If harm is being done to our loved ones and we respond, there's no other, uh, no other choice but to stop that threat, we're doing so out of love for our loved ones. And that should be our motivation. So self-defense isn't prohibited in the sixth commandment. An extension from this, an application of this on a broader scale is the second point here, and that is just war. Just war. Now there are some who believe that all war is wrong and amounts to murder. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks, this is what Christianity Today said uh, about, uh, about any response to 9-11. It said, if we kill as a response to this great tragedy, we are no better than the terrorists who launched this awful offensive. Killing is killing, and killing is wrong. Was well, that the case? If we respond in any kind of attack as a nation upon those who did this harm, are we responding in the exact same way as the terrorists? That's not what scripture teaches. Now, many wars are indeed unjust. Many wars are indeed wicked. But not all wars. And we see this throughout scripture. For example, in the Old Testament, we see God sanctioning the nation of Israel to go into the promised land to wage war against those wicked inhabitants. We also see uh, in Judges that God permits, God calls the 11 tribes to take up arms against the one tribe of Benjamin for their gross wickedness. God, God sanctions that. We also see in Romans 13, so this is the New Testament, that the state, the governing officials, that they are given a sword. And what does that sword represent? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a deadly weapon. It's a weapon that brings, that, that ultimately brings end of life. And the state is God's agent of wrath upon wicked and is to protect the innocent. So it's not wrong for the state to kill enemies in war, provided the war is just. 
Well, we might ask, well, what are some of those principles that might guide a just war? Well, well, Christians have held to the theory of just war, not all Christians, but the majority of Christians over the centuries, they've held to uh, principles of just war. And just for the sake of time, let me just mention five principles that Christians have held on to that must be in place for a war to be just. First, war is waged by a legitimate government. It's not just a group of people in town waging war against another country. It is the government. They're given the sword, so it's a legitimate government going to war. Second, it's for a worthy cause. Third, the force is proportional to the attack. So if there's an attack upon us and 100 people die, it wouldn't be just to respond by killing a million people, for instance. Fourth, it's against men who are soldiers. It's not against civilians. We're, protecting the, we're, we're attacking those who are taking up arms. We're not attacking innocent civilians. And fifth, when all other means of resolution have failed. So war is not a first option. War is a last resort. So those are some of the biblical principles for a war to be just that must be met. So a third form of killing that's not prohibited in the Sixth Commandment is capital punishment. Capital punishment. The Hebrew word there, ratzak, in, in our passage in, uh, in the Sixth Commandment, it's never used in the Old Testament in the legal system. And speaking of uh, governing authorities putting or, or magistrates putting a condemned criminal to death. And what we see in Scripture is that while it is wrong for us to personally avenge ourselves, God has given the sword to the state, and, the, and the, the state, as it says in Romans 13, that he is an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So God has given authority to the state, to the governing authorities, to put certain criminals to death for certain crimes. Here's what Thomas Watson says. For a public official to kill an offender, it's not murder. It's justice. A private person sins if he draws up the sword, but a public person sins if he puts away the sword. The, 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 the difference there is we don't have the authority to avenge ourselves. That authority, Romans 13, is given to the state, the governing officials. Now, I've heard people object before and say, well, how, how can you say that you're pro-life, that you value the dignity, the sanctity of life, but you're also pro-capital punishment. Isn't that being inconsistent? And the answer biblically is, it's precisely because we're pro-life, because we value the sanctity of life, that we must be pro-capital punishment. It's not an inconsistency at all. It is being thoroughly consistent. And why don't you see this from Genesis 9. Turn, turn back to Genesis 9. This is rooted all the way back right after the flood, in, uh, in God's commands right after the flood, and we see how it's not inconsistent holding the high value of life to insist upon capital punishment for certain crimes. So Genesis 9, starting in verse 5 and 6. And for your lifeblood, I will reckon, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from every man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Now listen to this. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his image. If someone commits bloodshed, they commit murder, God says what justice requires is that by another man, and we know from Romans 13, it is the state, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For man is made in the image of God. Human life is so valuable it is so precious. There's a sanctity to human life that if someone kills someone else, the only thing that can satisfy justice if that person pays for it with their own life. And what this means is that the common practice today, and it's becoming more common, that for a murderer to be sentenced to life imprisonment, that that is not justice. It is not justice. It actually cheapens human, human life. You can kill someone else. You can slaughter someone else. You can desecrate the image of God and destroy the image of God. And then you just spend time behind bars for the rest of your life. That's devaluing human life. And in fact, what happens is it's the society that pays twice. The society has now lost one of their own. And now the society has to bill the tax burden for the rest of that criminal's life. 
They're punished twice. That's not justice. God commands that if a man sheds the blood of someone innocent, by man shall his blood be shed. That shows the high value of human life. So those are three instances that killing is sometimes permitted and in other cases is required. So the second question now is, well, what, what kind of killing is prohibited in the sixth commandment? You shall not murder. Well, the word you shall not murder, the word ratzak, it speaks of the unjust killing of another human being. The unjust killing of another human being. And there's three different categories of this. The first category is murder. You, you shall not murder. The premeditated taking of an innocent life. Turn to Exodus 21, verse 14. Turn to Exodus 21, verse 14. Exodus 21, 14 says this, But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, then you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Now here you can see the, the, the premeditation that this person has. They willfully attack another person. This is not an accident. And they attack them by cunning. So they have been, they've been plotting this. They've been planning this beforehand. And that's the definition of first degree murder. It's killing with malice aforethought. You've been planning it out. You despise this person. You have a plan and then you carry it out. So that's the first thing that the Sixth Commandment is prohibiting, is it's prohibiting murder. The second thing that it's prohibiting is manslaughter. It, manslaughter. Manslaughter is a crime of passion. So you're not planning on killing someone else, uh, but you get so enraged at them in that moment that you end up taking their life. There's voluntary and there's involuntary manslaughter. There's a distinction, but both of them would be covered by the Sixth Commandment. Numbers 35, 16 through 18 says this, But if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. And if he struck him down with a stone tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Or if he struck him down with a wooden tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. So here there's these different examples, different tools that are used these tools can cause death. They weren't planning on doing this beforehand, but in the moment they get enraged and they pick up this iron object or this wooden object and they kill this other person. God says that person is a murderer. So manslaughter is prohibited by the sixth commandment. And then a third category here is negligent homicide. So you have murder, you have manslaughter, you also have negligent homicide. Now, with, with, with negligent homicide, you aren't actively taking someone else's life. But instead, by your own negligence, by your carelessness or by your recklessness, the effect is it results in the death of someone else. By your own negligence, it causes the death of someone else. So keep, keep your finger here over in Exodus, but go over to Deuteronomy 22, verse 8. Deuteronomy 22, Genesis, Exodus Leviticus, and then Deuteronomy 22. All right, are we there? All right, verse 8. When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. Now, this is a, a little bit of a hard-to-understand law. What's being talked about here? A parapet on a roof. Well, the roofs in those days, they didn't have a, a big pitch to them. They were flat roofs. And people would go on their roofs to relax at night, enjoy the cool breeze, and get away from the warm air that's trapped in their homes. So the roof was a place of, uh, of, of relaxing. It was a place where you would sit down. And when it's saying a parapet, that's speaking of a fence that's on the exterior of the roof. And here God's saying that if there is no parapet on the roof and someone is up on the roof and they fall off the roof and they die by your own negligence, then you bring blood guilt upon yourself. You're guilty of that person's um, death. So it's by your own negligence, by your own carelessness, by not taking these precautions, 
then you are, you are guilty before God. So this might look today, if we have an applica some applications today, this might look like having a daycare and you have a swimming pool and you don't put uh, some kind of an obstacle or fence around the pool. And then one of the toddlers falls into the pool and, and drowns. That would be negligent homicide. Or if a nurse neglects to, to feed a patient, that would also be negligent homicide if the patient ended up dying uh, from starvation. Or if someone withheld necessary med medication from a loved one. They just didn't give it to them. And as a result, they died. That would also be negligent homicide. So the Sixth Commandment, it's not just prohibiting actively taking someone else's life, planned or unplanned. It's also prohibiting, not, uh, being, it's prohibiting being reckless or careless towards someone else that results in their death. Murder, manslaughter, and negligent homicide, all of this is condemned in the Sixth Commandment. So what I want to do with the remainder of our time today is I want to bring this home to our culture today. What are particular applications of the Sixth Commandment in our day and age today? We'd all agree that murder is wrong, but there's particular applications that we may not so readily see. Let me give you three applications. The first is the Sixth Commandment prohibits suicide. The Sixth Commandment prohibits suicide. Now, in our day and age today, it is very common to look at someone who commits suicide only as a victim. Now, certainly, it is the case that when someone's taking their own life, they, they don't have hope. They're at the end of their own rope. They think life is absolutely pointless. And so certainly, they should have our compassion and our mercy. But this doesn't change that God is the one who gives life and God is the one who has the authority alone to take life. And we don't have the right to unlawfully take someone else's life, including our own. We don't have the right to unlawfully take someone else's life, including our own. There are at least five instances of suicide in Scripture. The most obvious is Judas Iscariot, when he went out and hung himself. And every one of these instances is portrayed as something that's shameful, and that's wrong. Every one is portrayed as shameful and wrong. And this is because self-murder is still self, is, it's still murder. We need to remember that God's word is a muzzle. It restrains us from evil. And sometimes people can feel so overwhelmed that they feel suicide is the only way out. But if they know God's law, that we are not permitted to take our own lives, that we don't have that authority, then even in the midst of their own despair, that realization of a holy God and his demands upon us, that may be the one thing that keeps them from taking their life. God's word is a muzzle upon us. And this is a word that we need to share because we live in a hopeless society today. The CDC said that in the 12-month period ending in April 2021, that there are over 100,000 overdose deaths in America. That's a record high, beating the previous high from the previous year, which is also a high, beating that by 28%. So from 2019 to 20, and then up to 2021, it was 28% higher in 20 to 21 than the previous year. And do you know the state where it increased the most percentage-wise? Vermont. Vermont it increased the most percentage-wise. There's something like 78% from the previous year. So there's a lot of hopelessness around us. There's a lot of hopelessness around us. Now, are, are all these people intentionally trying to kill themselves? Well, of course not. Of course not. But the vast majority do know that they were taking substances that were harmful to their body. And that in itself is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. So we need to tell our suicidal loved ones, we need to tell them, we love you. We love you. God loves you. Your life is precious to us and to God, even if you think it's pointless right now. And we also need to say, and you are not permitted by God to take your own life. That is not a way out. That truth, shared in love at the right moment, that may be the one thing that jolts them back from the edge 
and may bring them to more clear righteous thinking. In the book Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan hundreds of years ago, it's an allegory of the Christian life. Christian and hopeful, they are taken captive by giant despair. And giant despair, he puts them in his dungeon and he beats them every day with clubs. And it's, it's dark, it's gloomy, they are without hope. And uh, what the giant says, what the giant wants them to do is he wants them to kill themselves. He wants them to commit suicide. And Christian, he becomes so beyond hope that he says, I prefer strangling and death rather than this body of mine. And then Hopeful says this to Christian. Our present condition is indeed dreadful, and death would be far more welcome to me than to stay like this forever. But let's yet consider that the Lord of the country to which we are going has said, you shall not murder. No, not to murder another person. Much more than are we forbidden to take the giant's advice to kill ourselves. Besides, he who kills someone else can only commit murder of that person's body. But for one to kill himself is to kill the body and the soul at the same time. And let's consider again that all the law isn't in the hand of the giant despair. As I understand it, others have been taken by him as well and have yet escaped out of his hands. Who knows but what God who made the world may cause this giant despair to die or that at some time or another he may forget to lock us in. That's good counsel. On one hand, you're upholding the law of God. You're saying, God commands us, you shall not murder. That applies to yourself. You don't have the authority to do that. But on the other hand, Hopeful is also saying, look to God. Others have been in this dungeon before, captured by the giant, and, and they went free. God can kill this giant. God, maybe he'll forget to lock us in. We, we, God, God will bring us out in his own time. Keep looking to God. That's the kind of counsel and help that we should provide to those that are suicidal. The second thing that the Sixth Commandment prohibits is euthanasia. It prohibits euthanasia. Now, euthanasia, it comes from two Greek words, eu, which means good, and then uh, uh, thanasia, thanos, which means death. That's uh, uh, the Avengers, thanos, it, it, it's the Greek word, which means death. So in, in euthanasia, it's when a physician is intentionally causing a consenting patient's death. And usually it's when a patient is in incredible pain uh, toward the end of their life. Euthanasia, it's been legal here in our state for nine years, since 2013. Now, to be clear here, euthanasia is not the same. Uh, euthanasia is the termination of life. It's not the termination of treatment. And there is a distinction there. Of course, we should provide care to our loved ones whenever there is a reasonable hope of recovery. But if there is no longer any hope for recovery, we've done all that we can do, humanly speaking, then it's not wrong at that moment to remove treatment. So for instance, if a loved one is brain dead, it's not wrong to remove them from a respirator. That, that's, not, that's not taking their life, it's simply removing treatment and committing it to God. So there is a difference here between uh, taking someone else's life and ending treatment when it looks like it will do no good. You've done all that you can do. Euthanasia, euthanasia to end one's life, uh, is prohibited by God, even when you're, you're, you are in incredible pain and suffering. And a story in Scripture that applies to this is King Saul. You remember King Saul, that he was mortally wounded in battle, shot by an arrow. He had actually uh, fell upon his own sword, and he still wasn't dead. His life was still lingering. And then an Amalekite, one of the enemy forces, came up to him, saw it was King Saul, and, and King Saul begged this Amalekite, please end my life. And so the Amalekite ended his life, brought word to David, thinking that David would be, uh, would be thankful for what he's done. And here's what David says to this Amalekite. He says, your blood be on your own head. For your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. So even though Saul was terminally ill, he was in extreme pain, and he begged for someone to take his life, there's a lot of parallels with euthanasia there, it was still wrong for the Amalekite to take King Saul's life. Doctors cannot commit murder even if the patient is paying him to do it. That is still murder. So suicide, euthanasia, and then a final application is abortion. The Sixth Commandment 
prohibits abortion. Psalm 139 says that it's God who knits us together in our mother's womb. He's the one who shapes and fashions us even when we are an on-form substance. We're just a little tiny zygote. We're, we're still being shaped and fashioned by Almighty God. Scripture tells us that it's from the moment of conception that we are a living person made in the image of God. We are image bearer from the moment of conception. There's personhood at the moment of conception. Even if there's not the, the, the motor abilities that we have later on in life, we're still a person made in the image of God at the moment of conception. And what this means is that it is wrong to intentionally kill a preborn baby. Whether this be by clinical abortion or through a chemical abortion that kills a human embryo, like the day after pill or the abortion pill. That is, that is still murder. Now we've been told again and again in our culture that a woman has a right to an abortion. That a woman has a right to an abortion. Whoopi Goldberg said a few months ago, she said, do any of you men have any eggs or the possibility of carrying a fetus? How dare you talk about what a fetus wants? You have no idea. It's my body. It's my choice. But of course, beloved, what this fails to recognize is God. It doesn't factor in God. Who's the one that's creating this precious little embryo? It's God. In whose image is this little tiny baby made? It's God. Who alone has the authority to take this little baby's life? It's God. And it doesn't matter if the baby is within us or not. We still don't have the right to end that baby's life. That's still a violation of the Sixth Commandment. It's still murder. Abortion is murder. Now, brothers and sisters, one of the reasons why we need to hear the Sixth Commandment today, you shall not murder, is because the shedding of innocent blood brings blood guilt upon the land. The shedding of innocent blood brings blood guilt upon the land. And we saw this in the passage that Bill read. Let me read it again. Numbers 35. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. You shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land. And no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. Whenever innocent blood is shed, it pollutes the land. It defiles the land. It corrupts the land. It's like when Cain killed Abel, his brother Abel, and God came to Cain and he said, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. It's crying out for justice. God, I have been killed. I've been wrongfully killed. Your image has been destroyed. God, bring justice here. Innocent blood defiles the land and it cries out to God for justice. So what shall we say about our land today? What shall we say about America? Think of the application to our land today. Think about our land where millions are killed every year through murder, through suicide, through euthanasia, through abortion, and other means. Our land is polluted. Our land is desecrated today through the shedding of innocent blood. And Numbers 35 says, and nothing can make atonement for it. Nothing can make atonement for it. The blood in our land is crying out today before a holy God and saying, God, bring justice. Will you not judge America? How long will you wait, O oh God? There is no atonement for the shedding of innocent blood except for the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the only way that a polluted land can be atoned for. It's through the Lamb of God who is slain for sinners. His holy, his perfect, his pure spotless blood that was spilt on the cross for sinners like you and I, for murderers, that is the only thing that can cover the blood guilt of the shedding of innocent blood. That's the only way that, can, that we can be cleansed and forgiven and made new and reconciled to a holy God and be adopted into the family of God. That's the only way. There's nothing that we can do. It's only what Jesus Christ has done. That's the only, that's the only way out of it for us as a nation. 
There is no hope for us as a nation at all. Judgment of God is upon us right now. We can see it. And judgment of God will come all the more unless we as a nation turn to Jesus Christ. That's the only way out of this. It's Jesus Christ. And if we go to him in repentance and faith, we will find that he makes the vilest sinner clean. What can wash away my sin? What is it? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What's, what's the next line after that? What can make the foulest clean? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Praise God. And may God give us grace as a nation to turn to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, this is a sobering word, but Father, we thank you for the hope that's in Jesus Christ. And Father, we, we come as your people today. No doubt, there are many of us here where one way or another we are guilty of murder. And we're going to be looking at the heart of murder next week. But even in terms of promoting murder or advocating murder or encouraging murder or supporting murder or, more common, being silent about murder and not speaking out against it because we want to be well-liked. Father, we pray that you'd forgive us. We pray that you'd cleanse us. We pray that you'd wash us. And we know that can only happen through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.